Minister. Questions to the Prime Minister. Leila Moran. Number one, please, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the thoughts of members across the House with Maine, with all those affected by Hurricane Irma, particularly in our overseas territories, and I would like to update the House briefly. My right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, has travelled to the overseas territories to see the recovery work at first hand and assess what more is needed. As I told the House, as I told the House last week. We had a Navy ship pre-positioned in the region and humanitarian experts on the ground to coordinate the UK response. Since Thursday, COBRA has met regularly to coordinate the Government's response, bringing together military aid and consular effort. And Today I am announcing an additional £25 million to support the recovery effort, further to the £32 million of assistance I announced last week. We have now deployed over 1,000 military personnel to the region, with an additional 200 to arrive in the next few days, along with over 60 police. And more than 40 tonnes of aid has now arrived. And I am sure that members across the House would like to join me in paying tribute to the hard work of the many people, military and civilian, who are doing an incredible job in difficult circumstances. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Leila Moran. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to echo the Prime Minister's words of sympathy for the families, but especially the children affected by Hurricane Irma. Mr Speaker, Oxford, West and Abingdon has a vibrant local economy, but reliant on the university, science and car industries, it is set to shrink if we leave the single market and the customs union, risking thousands of local jobs. Isn't it time the Prime Minister was frank with people about the dangers of leaving and allowed them a say when we finally know the full facts? I have to say to the Honourable Lady that her uh, view of what is going to happen when we leave the European Union is not the right one. And if she is telling her... If she is telling her constituents that, then she needs to think again. She needs to work with the government to ensure we get the deal as we leave the European Union that gives us access to the single market, that enables us not just to have that access, but to do trade deals around the world, bring prosperity and jobs here to the UK. Mr Philip Davis. Uh, Mr Speaker, many of my constituents feel that Yorkshire has not had its fair share of the transport infrastructure cake over recent years, especially compared with London and the South East. Will the Prime Minister therefore promise to significantly increase the proportion of transport infrastructure which is spent in the North generally and in Yorkshire in particular in this Parliament? And perhaps my right honourable friend can start as she means to go on by ensuring we get the much needed and long awaited Shipley Eastern Bypass. My, my honourable friend raises an important point, and uh, he never ceases to raise the concerns of his constituents, as he rightly should, in this House. But we are committed to making sure that the whole country gets the transport infrastructure that it needs. And that's not about, I want to reassure him, it's not about making a choice between North and South. That's why we're carrying out one of the biggest investment, biggest investment in transport in the region for a generation spending £13 billion on northern transport in this Parliament, and that's the largest in government history. Now, as regards the Shipley Eastern Relief Road, I believe there is a decision to be taken by the local authority, but we do want to see these sorts of improvements being supported, and that's why we've allocated up to £781 million for the West Yorkshire Plus Transport Fund to deliver local priorities. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I too share the Prime Minister's uh, sympathy with all those affected by Hurricane Irma in whichever part of the uh, Caribbean they have suffered. I hope that the Prime Minister will be prepared to look carefully at the speed of our response to Hurricane Irma and if future uh, demands are made in the near future, in the next few days or weeks from any country affected by it, that Britain will respond as generously as we possibly can to help people at what must be the most catastrophic time of their lives. Uh, Mr Speaker, the situation facing disabled people in Britain is described by the United Nations Committee on Rights of Persons with Disabilities as a human catastrophe. 
Does the Prime Minister think that it was right that while her government funded tax giveaways to the richest, disabled people have been hit hardest by the cuts her government has made? Well, first of all, in response to the references that the Right Honourable Gentleman made to the UK response to Hurricane Irma, I can assure him that actually the UK response was a speedy one. We already had RFA Mounts Bay pre-positioned, as I have said, and it was able to go in immediately to Anguilla, first of all, to uh, make necessary repairs, such as ensuring that the hospital there could continue to operate, and it was able to do that straight away. But of course we recognise that the devastation that has taken place means that there will be a significant significant uh, need for reconstruction. Uh, in those British overseas territories. Of course, other uh, members of the Car- uh, countries that are members of the Caribbean have been hit and other countries in the region as well. But we will be obviously looking. Uh, there will be a point at which it's right to start the reconstruction uh, work. And of course, we will be working with our overseas territories to ensure that we are able to see those uh, countries actually brought to life once again and people able to get, have a, a, an economy and a good life there. In relation to the questions about disabled people, I have to say to the right honourable gentleman, that over the time that we have been in government, we have been seeing more disabled people get into the workplace. We have focused, crucially, we have focused the support we're giving to disabled people on those who are most in need, and we have increased the amount of uh, support that is being given overall to disabled people. So again, the picture that he presents is not a fair one. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, The United Nations Committee says, and I quote, that government policies have caused grave and systematic violations in the rights of disabled people. We've seen punitive assessments and sanctions, cuts to disability benefits and the bedroom tax that has hit disabled people, 4.2 million of whom now live in poverty. At the weekend, Mr Speaker, we were told that the public sector pay cap had been dropped. On Monday, the Prime Minister's spokesperson said it would continue as planned. Yesterday, they said the pay cap was over, but later found out that uh, we found out that police and prison officers still face a real terms pay cut. So, could the Prime Minister tell us what the position is at midday today? <laughs> Can I say, first of all, I would just remind the Right Honourable Gentleman, as I've just said, we spend over £50 billion a year on benefits to support disabled people and people from health conditions. And as a share of GDP, our public spending on disability and incapacity is the second highest in the G7. So I suggest he thinks again in relation to this. And in relation to the question of public sector pay, I said to him, I think it was only last week when uh, questions were raised about this, that there were two further public sector pay review bodies to report and the government had to respond to those pay review bodies. Those were for prison officers and for police officers. They reported, they made their recommendations and as we have accepted the recommendations of the independent pay review bodies across the public sector, we accepted them for those two groups of workers. But we also We also recognise, as I've said to him before, that we need to ensure that we balance out protecting jobs in the public sector, being fair to public sector workers uh, and being fair to taxpayers who pay for it, many of whom are public sector workers. There is a need need for greater flexibility as we look at these uh, uh, issues of public sector pay in the future. We will be working on this in the lead up to the budget and the remits for the pay review bodies for 2018-19 will be published in due course. Jeremy Corbyn. Does the Prime Minister understand that inflation is now 2.9%? Anything less means that dedicated public servants are worse off again and they've been made worse off every year for the past seven years. Yesterday, the Prison Officers Association weren't impressed either with the 1.7% offer, saying it's a pay cut, it's not acceptable. We discovered, Mr Speaker, that they have been offered, the police as well, a slightly smaller real terms cut in their incomes, came the news that this will be funded by more service cuts. Can the Prime Minister guarantee no more police or prison officers will be lost as a result of the decisions she has made this week? 
What the, uh, uh, what the right honourable gentleman uh, fails to remind people is that these pay review bodies who have reported and recommended these sums of pay are independent bodies. They make a recommendation to the government, and the government has taken, has taken, those, uh, has taken those recommendations. But he's also failed to mention one or two other things. He's failed to mention the automatic pay increases over and above the 1% that many public sector workers get. Indeed, a calculation suggests that a new police officer in 2010, thanks to uh, progression pay and annual uh, basic salary increases and the increase in the personal allowance that is a tax cut for people, are actually over, have actually seen an increase in their pay of over £9,000 since 2010, a real terms increase of 32%. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, there are, there are 20,000... Uh, far too much noise in the chamber. We'll get through all the questions, however long it takes, but it's just a bit tedious if it's disrupted by excessive noise. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There are 20,000 fewer police officers and 7,000 fewer prison officers than there were in 2010. 43 per cent of police stations have closed in the last two years alone. Police budgets cut by £300 million. But the Chancellor is absolutely on the money on this one, literally. Because last week at the 1922 committee meeting, he told Conservative MPs... He told Conservative MPs, look at us, no mortgage, everybody with a pension, never had more money in the current account. A Conservative Prime Minister... A Conservative Prime Minister once told Britain, you've never had it so good. Now Tory MPs tell each other, we've never had it so good. Can the Prime Minister tell us what's happened in the last seven years to the average person's bank account? Can I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, and um, I'm very interested, you know, he's talking about for ordinary people, he's talking about uh, what the situation that they face. This is his fourth question. He has not yet mentioned the employment figures today. That show, that show, that show unemployment at lowest levels since the mid 1970s. And employment, people in work. People taking home a wage, a salary to support their families at record levels, the highest level since records began. Jeremy Corbyn. The only problem is more people in work are in poverty than ever before. More are in insecure work. More relying on tax credits and housing benefit to make ends meet. Consumer debt rising by 10% as wages are falling. Household savings lower than at any time for the past 50 years. That is the Conservative legacy. Mr Speaker, a young woman called Aisha wrote to me last week and she says, and she says, I have recently graduated from university with a hefty amount of debt on my head. However, and she goes on, Mr. Speaker, I cannot understand why Conservative MPs don't want to listen to this question. I really can't. However, I will persist. However, she goes on, I am scared about the futures of other young people. People have always dreamed of being a nurse, no longer want to train to become one. Her government, in, with the support of the Lib Dems, trebled tuition fees. Will the Prime Minister take the opportunity this afternoon to vote against another Tory hike in student fees? Well, I have to say to the right honourable gentleman, once again there are a few things about people's circumstances that he has failed to mention. Things that the government has done, things that the government has done, taking 30 million, giving a tax cut to 30 million people. That means means for a basic rate taxpayer £1,000 more in their pockets. That's what, that's 
what sound management of the economy by a Conservative government delivers for people. But the right hon. Gentleman talks. The right hon. Gentleman talks about delivering for students. Let's talk about delivery. Let's talk about promises that are made. He promised. He promised. Oh, oh, order! It's far too much noise on both sides of the chamber. I say in all candour and friendliness to the Honourable Member for Brent Central, who's in a very animated state. I don't know what you had for breakfast, but I think I ought to steer clear of it. The Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Right Honourable Gentleman promised workers that he'd protect their rights, and on Monday he let them down. He promised students, he promised students that he would deal with their debt, and he's let them down. people that he would support Trident, and he's let them down. And he promised voters he'd deliver on Brexit, and he's let them down. What people know is that it's only the Conservatives that deliver a better Britain. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the Institute of Fiscal Studies reports that English graduates have the highest student debts anywhere in the world. The poorest students now graduating with an average debt of £57,000. Who is responsible but her party and the Liberal Democrats of that situation? Mr Speaker, we are in the middle of an economic slowdown. The OBR says there is a growing risk of recession under her watch. Growth is slowing, productivity worsening, wages falling, jobs becoming more insecure, personal debt increasing, saving levels falling and homelessness rising all over the country. And it's forecast that by the end of this Parliament, five million children in this country, the fifth richest country in the world, will be living in poverty. Isn't it true that not only is our economy at breaking point, but for many people, it's already broken as they face up to the poverty imposed by this government. Can I just say to the right honourable gentleman, yet again, he has failed to mention on student fees. Who was it who introduced tuition fees? Look at what has happened. Let's look at what has happened in our economy. What do we see? Record levels of direct investment in the, in the British economy. Firms investing in this country because they believe in the future of this country. The, what we also see from the employment figures today, more people in work than ever before. We see more women in work. We see more 16 to 24 year olds in work or in full time education than we've seen before. That's what you get with a strong economy. And what do we know and what do the people know? That the Labour Party, with its high debt, its high taxes, its fewer jobs, the Labour Party would only destroy our economy as they did last time. We had to sort it out. The only people who pay the price for the Labour Party are ordinary working families. Edward, Edward Arger. Thank you, sir. Britain's countryside, and I would argue Charmwood's countryside, is the most spectacular in the world because it is cared for by our farmers. Given today is the NFU's Back British Farming Day, will my right honourable friend join me in recognising the huge contribution farming makes to our economy and our country, and in her clear determination to deliver a Brexit that works for Britain, will she ensure it is a Brexit that works for Britain's farmers as well? Well, I'm very happy to join uh, my honourable friend in marking back British Farming Day and recognising the enormous contribution, the important contribution that is made by the food and farming industry to our economy. But as he uh, implies in his question, leaving the EU does give us a new opportunity for UK agriculture. We'll be able to design policies for our agricultural industry that, and our food and farming industry that actually suit the United Kingdom and suit our countryside and suit our environment and can provide better value for the taxpayer. So, yes, I'm happy to back 
uh, his, the back British farming day. And yes, we will make a success of at, uh, leaving the European Union for our food and farming industry. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since 2007, annual real wage growth in the OECD has been an average of 6.4%. Can the Prime Minister explain to the House how the UK has measured up over the same period? Yeah. I think it might be quite interesting for the Honourable Gentleman to tell the House about the economy in Scotland, which is, uh, I, I, seem to, uh, I seem to recall uh, that uh, the economy in Scotland is not doing as well as the economy. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. The Honourable Gentleman Member of Inhelia and Yah shouldn't yell from a sedentary position. I have been doing my best to nurture the Honourable Gentleman's <laughs> rise to statesmanship, but he thwarts me at every turn. At every turn. Calm, repose, the statesmanlike behaviour of the Father of the House would be more appropriate. The Prime Minister. Well, I say to the Honourable Gentleman, as I say, he should look at what is happening to the economy in Scotland under an SNP government, because it is an SNP government that is failing the people of Scotland. And, and the only thing I would say to him is actually the people of Scotland now have a strong voice in this House through our 13 Conservative yeah. members of Parliament. Yeah. Mr. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was under the impression this was questions to the Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. To question the Scottish Government, perhaps you can get Ruth Davidson to ask a question. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the UK's record on earnings has been significantly worse than almost oh, every other yes. developed country. Oh, in fact, true. real wages in the UK have fallen by 2.6 per cent since 2007. Wages aren't growing, the cost of living is rising, household budgets are stretched. Mr Speaker, the Government can find the money for quantitative easing, $435 billion since 2009, but can't find the money for fiscal measures to grow the economy. This is a Government that does not understand how to use economic levers, and it is our people that are paying the price. Will the Prime Minister take responsibility for the Government's gross mismanagement of the UK economy? And I notice, I think that in all of that rather lengthy question that the Honourable Gentleman asked, <laughs> never once did he recall the increase in employment that has taken place across the United Kingdom and what the figures show today. But he also he started, he started off by standing up and complaining that I had referenced the, uh, the acts of the Scottish Government. He believes in independence. He believes that Scotland should only be run by the Scottish Government. So I think the Scottish people deserve to look, and in this House we deserve to talk, about what the Scottish Government is or is not doing for the people of Scotland. The one thing, the one thing I can tell him and others is that the Scottish economy and the livelihoods of the people of Scotland are better off in the United Kingdom. We have some very excitable denizens of the House today. I, they, they ought to take some sort of medicament and they'll calm down. James Heapy. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, residents in communities across the Wales constituency have been angered this summer by a seemingly endless stream of illegal traveller encampments. Yeah. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister look at what more government could yeah. do yeah. to help local authorities close legal, these illegal encampments more quickly yeah. and at less cost to local taxpayers? Yeah. Can I say to my honourable friend that he's raised an important issue? It's not an issue that is uh, unique to his constituency of Wells. It is felt by many uh, members across this House, and we are concerned about unauthorised encampments and the effect that they have when they leave communities. There is a wide range of powers available to both local authorities and police. We want to see them working together and with local landowners. But we do keep these matters under review, and I'm sure my right honourable friend, the Community Secretary, will be happy to meet with my honourable friend to discuss this. Leon. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, four years ago, after the death of her mother, my constituent Alyssa became the sole carer for her three siblings. Now, her elder sister has gone to university, and Alyssa has had a child of her own. But despite saving the state hundreds of thousands of pounds in care costs, Alyssa is ineligible for the Sure Start grant and for child tax credits. Uh, this is an anomaly for kinship carers. Will the Prime Minister today commit to reviewing this ahead of the autumn budget? Yeah. Yeah. Well, 
Um, the, obviously, there are certain rules that are in place for these, uh, for these situations. Um, I, the Honourable Lady has raised a situation with various aspects to it. And can I suggest that she writes to me about that, and I'll look at the detail that she's set out. Closed question, Mr Michael Fabricant. Question 8, sir. Oh, I will be happy to meet the new Conservative Mayor of the West Midlands when my diary allows. Yeah. Mr Michael Fabricant. I'm very encouraged to hear it. Uh, last week, in the face of stiff competition, Birmingham defeated the brilliant Liverpool uh, approach and won the uh, award for the Commonwealth Games in the West Midlands, which is excellent news for the economy, not only for Birmingham, but also for the Greater West Midlands, including Lichfield. So would my right honourable friend speak, and I see she's sitting next to him, to the Chancellor to ensure that he backs the bid as well, and then bat for Britain to ensure that Birmingham wins the Commonwealth Games over Kuala Lumpur? Yeah. Well, can I, can I say to my honourable friend, I'm grateful for his question. I, I do, uh, Mr. Speaker, I have noticed that my honourable friend apparently is shortly to appear on a Channel 4 programme called Celebrity First Dates. I'm, um, <laughs> What I'm not sure about is whether my honourable friend is the celebrity or the first date, but maybe he can tell us about that. But he's raised, he's raised uh, the issue of the Commonwealth Games, and uh, obviously the Commonwealth Games being hosted in the UK in 2022 in Birmingham would present a unique opportunity for the West Midlands, and it would, of course, promote Global Britain across the Commonwealth. Uh, the next step is for Birmingham to demonstrate value for money in their bid. And, uh, but I've, subject to that, I have no doubt that Birmingham will continue the UK's rich history of hosting successful sporting events. Louise Haig. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Crime involving mopeds and bikes has soared across the country in recent years. Given yesterday's unfunded real terms pay cut to the police will actually cost us more frontline officers, can I suggest to the Prime Minister that the very least she can do is change the law to protect police officers if they are driving according to their training and experience when pursuing and responding to blue lights and send a message from this House that no force should be operating a blanket no-pursuit policy. The police protect us every day. Isn't it high time that the Prime Minister protected them? Well, first of all, I agree that there shouldn't be blanket no-pursue policies in in place, but obviously each Chief Constable will make operational decisions about in their own own force. On the first issue that she raised, about the issue of crime relating to uh, to mopeds and particularly, um, this has been recognised. She puts it as an issue of funding. It's not an issue of funding. It's an issue of how you respond to those crimes. And I'm pleased to say that my right honourable friend, the Policing Minister, held a round table on exactly this issue yesterday to look at how we can ensure that the police are responding fully to it. David Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister because she's put me in touch with her powerhouse minister and uh, we're looking now to get an enterprise zone in Hesham in my constituency. But ever wanting to have a big wish list, would the Prime Minister help me in any way possible with my already ongoing uh, campaign to get the third nuclear power station built quicker in Hesham, the tentatively linked Hesham Free Power Station? Well, uh, once again, my, my honourable friend has, is campaigning tirelessly for his constituency, and I welcome his uh, efforts across a number of issues, as he has referred to. We do uh, need affordable, clean and, uh, energy to keep the lights on and in the decades ahead, and he's absolutely right that nuclear energy is an important part of our energy mix. Now, as regards the particular site, I believe there is land uh, next to the existing Hesham nuclear power station, which is one of the eight sites in the UK that has been designated for new nuclear build. Hannah Bardell. Mr Speaker, the House and the Prime Minister will remember the case of my constituent Lola Ilisami, whose daughter is under threat of female genital mutilation from Lola's abusive ex-partner. I want to thank Channel 4 News and Cathy Newman for breaking the story, and I want to thank the Prime Minister for intervening and granting an 18-month reprieve. Lola now has temporary right to work, but no recourse to public funds if she cannot find a job. Long-term certainty is what this wee girl and this family needs. Will the Prime Minister look again at this case and allow Lola and her family to stay long-term 
in Livingston. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Honourable Lady is right. Obviously, she raised this case before, and the Immigration Minister, as I understand it, was in touch with her. And as she has said to the House, I can confirm uh, that following a comprehensive and rigorous review, Miss Elizalmi has now been granted leave to remain in the United Kingdom, as the Honourable Lady set out. I wanted to say something about the female genital mutilation issue, because she raised that and the concern about uh, the daughter and the threat that she might be under. This is an absolutely abhorrent crime. A lot has been done by the government to deal with the FGM issue, but we cannot tolerate this practice. And Our work to tackle FGM is an integral part of our violence against women and girls strategy, which we published in March last year. I think we all accept, though, that we do need to do more to ensure that young children are not, young girls are not subject to this horrific abuse. Kelly Tolhurst. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right hon. Friend agree that the party opposite's cynical attempt to block the EU withdrawal bill on Monday shows that they are still only interested in playing party politics rather than delivering the best deal for our future, which is what my constituents and the majority of this country want to see. Well, my, my hon. Friend is absolutely right. I think most people in this country want to see the government doing what we're doing, which is getting on with the job of delivering the best deal for Britain from Brexit. And I, there was a certain amount of noise from the opposition benches when I said earlier that the right hon. Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, had failed to uh, had let workers down by failing to protect their rights on Monday. But that's exactly one of the issues that was there. What that bill was about was bringing workers' rights EU, that are in EU legislation here into the UK, and he he voted against it. This is Emma Newell Buck. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As the Prime Minister was visiting survivors of the Manchester terror attack, families who were heartbroken to have lost their children were also in the vicinity, but they were not visited by the Prime Minister. Chloe Rutherford and Liam Curry from South Shields tragically lost their lives. The parents feel ignored by the Prime Minister. I wrote to her seven weeks ago with their concerns, but she's failed to respond. When will she properly acknowledge their loss? Can I just say, the honourable lady has raised, an, well, the honourable lady has raised an important issue. I'm not aware of her letter, so I will, of course, look into that immediately uh, today to uh, to see why she has not received a response. And I can only apologise to her for the fact that she has not received a response yet. I did, and at the time, and continue to acknowledge that that attack in Manchester damaged lives in many ways. It, those who were injured and who may be living with the consequences of their injuries, uh, those who lost loved ones, who lost relatives, who lost friends, will be affected by it. And of course, there are those lives that were sadly cut short at all too young an age. What we all must do is ensure, yes, we're providing support for the victims, but we also must ensure that we have the powers for our authorities and police authorities and agencies so that they're able to prevent attacks in the future. But I will look into the issue of the letter uh, uh, because, as I say, she should have had a response uh, already, and I'm sorry that, it was seven, that seven weeks have gone by and she hasn't. Ross Thompson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Successful offshore Europe exhibition last week in Aberdeen. Can the Prime Minister give me and my constituents reassurance that support for the oil and gas industry will be at the heart of the industrial strategy so that we can maximise economic recovery in the North Sea? And does she agree with me that the biggest threat to the industry would be the instability of a second divisive independence yeah. referendum? Honourable friend is absolutely right. We have, of course, already given significant support to the oil and gas industry. I was pleased some, uh, some months ago to visit Aberdeen and to visit the technology centre for the oil and gas industry there, which is doing really interesting work, looking not just at the existing uh, fields, obviously, but at decommissioning work and how they can export their knowledge and expertise across the world. But he's absolutely right. What people want, what businesses want, is the certainty of knowing that Scotland will remain in the United Kingdom and there won't be a second independence referendum. Daniel Zeichner. Cambridge parents tell me that when young people returned to schools and colleges last week, in some cases they found that almost half the cooks and cleaners had gone. The Cambridge News reports that pubs in the area won't be able to serve food because they can't find the skilled staff to do it. Isn't it ironic? 
taking back control is a further blow to the great British pub. Can the Prime Minister tell us what plans she's put in place to help institutions deal with this chronic and acute sudden shortage of labour? Yeah. The, the Honourable Gentleman talks as if there is no net migration into this country any longer, whereas, of course, there is net migration into this country. People are coming into this country to take on, to take on work. But there's a wider issue that we need to deal with, uh, that the, the Government is dealing with as a result, and uh, we've seen that in some of the announcements my right honourable friend, Secretary of State for Education, has made, which is making sure that people, young people here in the United Kingdom do get the training, do get the skills, do get the technical education they need to be able to take on the skilled jobs of the future. Mike Wood. Yeah, uh, Mr. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, today is World Sepsis Day. Sepsis claims at least 44,000 lives a year in the UK, and earlier this year I almost became part of that tragic statistic. Will the Prime Minister look at what more the Government could be doing to support awareness uh, raising programmes so that we can catch sepsis more quickly, yeah. treat it more effectively yeah, 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 yeah. and save more lives? Yeah. Well, I'm sure, I'm sure I would echo uh, the feelings of everybody across this whole House in saying that we are pleased that my honourable friend managed to battle sepsis and come through and win that particular fight. And I commend him for his recovery, and, but also commend all those who supported him in that fight and in that battle, including, of course, the excellent medical staff who provided him with the care he needed. He's absolutely right. The estimate is that 10,000 deaths per year could be prevented by better and earlier diagnosis of sepsis. And that's, so we do need to get better at spotting it and get more uh, at raising awareness. So we will be publishing a new sepsis action plan a nice quality uh, for the NHS. A nice quality standard is due to be published this week, and NHS England is also going to be publishing guidance to further support frontline staff. Kirsty Blackman. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, at the last census, there were 3,000 Aberdonians who said that they were born in Nigeria. Um, recently, the UN Human Rights Office reported concerns about threats to the Igbo people in northern Nigeria. I know the Foreign Secretary recently visited the country. Could she tell me what her government is doing to encourage the communities there to live in peace? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, we we do make efforts across a number, of, a number of fronts in relation to this, and we are giving support to Nigeria in a whole variety of ways. And as she says, there is a significant diaspora of people with uh, connections and heritage in Nigeria here in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's right that the Foreign Secretary has uh, visited Nigeria, and we continue to work with Nigeria. And one of the things that I think is important is working with Nigeria on the state of their economy to ensure that communities across Nigeria can feel stability and security for the future. Victoria Atkins. Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yesterday, the Shadow Justice Secretary refused four oh, times right. to condemn illegal strike action, yeah. and yeah. Labour's yeah. biggest yeah. Yeah. union paymaster yeah. seems to agree. Such illegal action would, of course, cause misery for millions of people across the country. Does my right honourable friend join me in condemning illegal action? And does she agree with me that it is we Conservatives who understand that this great country was built on the principles of democracy and the rule of law? Well, I thank uh, my honourable friend for her question, and she's absolutely right. I was struck, I was struck this week to see that Len McCluskey, uh, or perhaps Mahatma as his friends call him, uh, that Len McCluskey had said, if they need to act outside the law, so be it. Well, I have to say that I join my honourable friend. On this side of the House, we are very clear. We condemn illegal strikes. We condemn action outside of the law. And the, only, the people who suffer from those illegal strikes are the ordinary working families who can't get their children to school, who can't access the public services they need, and who can't get to work. Once again, the price of labour is paying for ordinary working families. Jamie Stone! Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, owing to recent changes to maternity services in my constituency, a vastly increased number of pregnant mothers I have to make an over 200-mile return trip to give birth. You can imagine how dangerous it is in the depths of a highland winter. While I recognise this is a devolved matter, could I nevertheless ask the Prime Minister for advice 
as to how I can help sort out this desperate situation. Can I say to the honourable gentleman, obviously he is right to speak up on behalf of his constituents in the Highlands. Uh, he's referenced the fact that uh, health is a matter for Scotland as a devolved matter. So, of course, it's for the Scottish Government to make full use of their powers available to deliver the health care services people in Scotland deserve. I think the people in Scotland uh, will be sorry that the Scottish Government is failing. The SNP Government in Scotland is failing to deliver for them in relation to health services. Uh, and of course, this week we marked the 20th anniversary of the vote to create the Scottish Parliament, so it's equ- uh, particularly, uh, uh, particularly notable. But as, I, the right honourable, as the honourable gentleman takes his place in this house, uh, can I welcome him to his place in this house? I, I wish him the best in his efforts, and I say I think standing up and mentioning the failure of the Scottish Government in this house is part of the answer to his question. Uh, Dr. Julian Lewis, the widow of our murdered colleague Ian Gow has expressed dismay and disgust that hundreds of former soldiers face reinvestigation yet again about incidents <coughs> 40 years ago whilst the suspected killers of her husband walk free. Will the Prime Minister now bring forward legislation for a statute of limitations coupled with a truth recovery process finally to put an end to this grotesque situation as she is perfectly able to do. Yeah. Well, can I, can I say, first of all, to my honourable friend, that the overwhelming majority of our armed forces in Northern Ireland served with great distinction, and we owe them a huge debt of gratitude for what they did. Now, obviously, as part of our work to implement the Stormont House Agreement, we will ensure the new legacy bodies will be under legal obligations to be fair, balanced and proportionate. And this will make sure that our veterans are not unfairly treated and will recognise the fact that 90% of the deaths in the Troubles were caused by terrorists, and we should never forget that fact. But our focus is on ensuring that the investigative bodies responsible for looking at deaths during the Troubles will operate in a fair, balanced and proportionate manner. Jonathan Edwards. Dear Mr Speaker, today is also Back Welsh Farming Day, and NFU Cymru estimate that agriculture contributes uh, 60,000 jobs in Wales as well as half a billion pounds. How will farming be able to continue that contribution once the International Trade Secretary opens up domestic markets to lower standard food while simultaneously losing unrestricted access to our main export market? Well, I'm very happy, as I said, I back uh, back Britain Farming uh, Day and uh, obviously back those farmers in Wales as well. And I've been pleased in recent months to visit uh, farmers and sit down and talk to farmers in Wales. uh, What we are doing in relation to the European Union is looking to leave uh, the European Union with a good trade deal which will enable, continue to enable trade to take place on as friction-free and uh, tariff-free basis as possible. And that will be good for Welsh farmers. But we also want to to ensure, and I think there are opportunities for Welsh farmers for exporting around the rest of the world that we can ensure with our trade deals with the rest of the world. Mr. Simon Hall. Mr. Speaker, uh, tomorrow I will have the uh, great honour and privilege of hosting uh, in this place a celebratory event marking the 50th anniversary of the Multiple Sclerosis Society. Yeah. We will be welcoming partners from across the world who, are co- who have come together over that half century in order to try to tackle and defeat that pernicious condition. Could I invite my right honourable friend as Prime Minister to send both her good wishes to the MS Society internationally as we celebrate this important milestone, but also commit the Government, as it has done over the last few years, to work across the departments in order to ensure that those with MS have both the maximum support and also the encouragement to get back into work, which so many of them wish to do. Well, I thank my honourable friend for raising this issue, and I'm very happy to join with him in sending uh, absolutely our best wishes to the MS Society. And I know from my own family the impact that multiple sclerosis can have. Uh, The Society does campaign tirelessly for people with MS, and uh, I'm very pleased that he is hosting a reception to mark this important milestone. Uh, We have seen progress over the last 15 years 
The Department of Health has made uh, funding available for neurological research, which of course does include MS. But as he says, this is not an issue that is just for the Department of Health. It is important, as we are doing in the Department of Work and Pensions, to look at helping people with MS in back into the workplace, because many of them want to be able to continue to be in the workplace and to provide for themselves and their families. Mr. Norman Lamb. Uh, f- four years after teenager Christina Edkins was tragically killed by Philip Simulane, a man who was acutely ill with psychosis and who had only recently been released from prison, the chair of the independent panel has expressed his extreme concern that vulnerable prisoners are still being released from prison without adequate support. Will the Prime Minister give it an urgent priority to ensure that we guarantee that there is proper support, proper continuity of pet care and the sharing of information between prison and mental health services to reduce the risk of another tragedy taking place? The, the, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman raises an important, uh, a very important issue. On mental health, he has campaigned long and hard on this issue and, and uh, made a huge contribution in doing that. But what I would say to him is this issue of the relationship between health services and prison is a long-standing one. Efforts have been made, and there have been some progress made, in improving that, uh, that relationship in relation to the responsibilities of the Department of Health, of the NHS, in, uh, in uh, prisons, to ensure that exactly the sort of cross-cutting um, action can be taken. But, of course, we will continue to look at this. Nigel Huddleston. Thank you, yeah. Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is an honour every day to work alongside some incredibly talented female MPs on both sides of the chamber. There is a Westminster Hall debate this afternoon on women in Parliament. What does the the second female Prime Minister believe should be done to get even more talented women into Parliament? Well, can I I say to my my honourable friend, I'm very pleased because I think he is playing his own role uh, in helping to support women to... I think he is playing his own role in helping to support women to win. The organisation within the Conservative Party, which is encourages, encourages women to see uh, Parliament as a career for them and to gain the expertise and the skills and to uh, uh, ensure that they come forward onto these benches. I am very pleased to see the increased number of women Conservative MPs we have in this House. And as a party, as a, as a party we will continue. As a party, we will continue to support women coming into Parliament and encourage, through the excellent role models we have of Conservative members of Parliament in this House, more women to come forward. Finally, Sir Vincent Cable. Can the, um, can the Prime Minister explain the logic behind treating uh, European fruit pickers and cleaners as an economic threat? while at the same time being completely relaxed about European ownership and control of the railways, the water system, the electricity companies, uh, and indeed last week the takeover of one of Britain's few remaining technology companies, Aviva. Isn't this a question of being biddable to big business, but paranoid about people? Can I just say to to the right honourable gentleman that um, we are very clear in relation to immigration that we want to welcome the brightest and best to come here to the United Kingdom. We uh, we have rules for people from outside the EU and we will be able to have our own rules for people coming from inside the EU. But could I also congratulate the right honourable gentleman on his election to the leadership of his party. He and I, of course, worked together during the years of the coalition. We didn't always agree on absolutely uh, absolutely everything. But I do note he's raised, he's raised uh, this issue of our relationship with Europe, and I, he had, did say something I agreed with, that a second EU referendum would be seriously disrespectful and politically utterly counterproductive. So I was rather disappointed to hear that he has now reversed his position and backs a second referendum. But perhaps it's not unusual for a Liberal Democrat to say one thing before the election and another after it. 